Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, almost everyone knows somebody now that's got Omicron. There's no family around that doesn't have at least one member that's got it. It's all over the place. So if you look at the world map, same place is on fire, Australia, United States. But I want you to see this little area down there. That's Chile because we're going to talk a little bit about that. If this I, were a weather map, I decided to pull out what it looked like December 3rd and what it looks like now. Look at that. From there to there in one short month. If that were a weather report, I'd say viral blizzard is on the way. You know, and, and we still only have 63% of the, of the population uh, vaccinated. So, of course, my sister wants to know, what's the weather report? What's it going to be like tomorrow? And when is this going to all end? What's interesting, our friends at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington had been predicting January 28th is the peak. But, you know, they got it wrong. And the reason they got it wrong is because whenever you do a projection, there's lots of different assumptions that you make. And your projection is totally based upon the, the validity of the assumptions. Well, the assumptions that everyone made was didn't realize how infectious this virus is. And so they really pushed it back to peaking like it already peaked in January 2nd. Now, they might be right, but you know, I've decided to take the far farmer's almanac approach and do the lily method because, you know, <laughs> it's probably as good as anybody else's method. So let's look at, you know, other countries have been through this already. So, you know, Greece, the United Kingdom, and South Africa have had big peaks and are coming down. And if you look at when did the start of Omicron begin and when did they hit peak, it varies based on the size of the country. So Greece, it was three weeks. South Africa was four to five weeks. UK was about eight weeks. And so, you know, if you start going like, well, what is, what do we look like? You know, who are you going to pick? Well, this is Lily's method. It's not exactly the same. Lily and Leo don't look exactly the same, but close enough. And so if we look at when did the United Kingdom start, start its peak upward uh, from Omicron, it was actually November 12th. The United States was about two weeks after that, about November 28th. So if you think of we're eight weeks following the UK, then our peak would be January 16th. That was this week. <laughs> Let's pray. If that's the case, then we should have already peaked and be coming down. Well, that looks like it might be pretty accurate. New York City is already plateauing. Boston is looks like it's coming to a, uh, a plateau, Chicago, L.A. And in fact, in looking at wastewater data uh, in Boston, they peaked around January 1st, which is what IHME said. Lily says January 19th, but IHME says the 1st. And our own mayor, Mayor Turner, has been following our wastewater. We've been sequencing along with Rice University. And it looks like our wastewater peaked January 2nd. So for all intents and purposes, I think we actually are peaking. This is Lily's prediction, January 16th or so. You can see our, our case number, although extremely high, 13,000 per day. It has come to a plateau. And hospitalizations, although you know, still high at 413, are down from last week at 487. Now, it's not all good news. You know, we were talking about how mortality hadn't changed. Well, that's not really true. Now, if you look at Greece, the United Kingdom, and South Africa, those very countries we were talking about, their mortality is beginning to increase slightly. It's not like it was with Delta, but it is going up. And even in the United States, if you look at our numbers, yeah, we have this huge peak in case numbers, but our latest mortality is beginning to increase slightly. Now, it's still better than Delta. Thank goodness for that. If you look at what we did compare this year, this winter to last winter, case number is way higher, hospitalizations are less, and deaths are less than last year with Delta. So we're still doing better than with Delta, but you know, it's not perfect. And who's getting admitted and who's still having problems? It's really the older age group, over 70, over 65. That's who's being hospitalized with Omicron. So we, you know, it's still a problem, it's still a bad disease better than Delta, but uh, uh, still a bad disease. So we have more data that, you know, it's less uh, severe than Delta. Big study from Kaiser Permanente in California looked at 52,000 cases with Omicron and 16,000 cases with Delta and compared a number of different parameters. For hospital admissions, Omicron was about one-third of Delta. ICU admissions, one-fourth of Delta. Mortality, one-tenth. And the hospital stay was about three and a half days shorter. So clearly less virulent than uh, Delta. So what, so what should we do? I mean, you know, 
We always turn to look at Israel. What are they doing? I'm not sure why we're doing that anymore because they're kind of acting crazy. But if you look at their fifth wave, huge spike, slight uh, increase in hospitalizations in ICU. But all of this is leading to a lot of frustration worldwide. So, you know, what do we do? A lot of my friends, a lot of my friends go like, well, just forget it. We're all going to get it, which is not true. Uh, it shouldn't be true, but there is that sense of capitulation. Or the other thing is, why don't we double down on, on preventing the disease by getting vaccinated or more boosters or practicing public health better? So the reason not to uh, completely capitulate is we don't know enough about the disease that it's okay for everyone to get it. So we already know that there are cardiac complications, neurologic complications, pulmonary there's potentially an increase in diabetes. There's this brain fog syndrome, long haul syndrome. So, you know, that's not, we don't want that. So the question is, is that, you know, what about the normal people? We all say, well, those are different people. What about normal people? Well, my favorite thing is let's look to real normal people. Let's look at football players, soccer players in the United Kingdom and in, in Germany. There are three economists who decided to look at players who got infected and what the long-term effects were. And they looked in the Bundesliga in Germany and Serie A in Italy. These are top-end uh, soccer leagues. And the first thing you can see is in the red line, the number of players that were positive. And that's compared in the gray, the population. And the reason they found a lot more players that were positive is because they were testing them every day. So they were more likely to pick them up. And, and this is my favorite. They looked 10 weeks later, how are they doing? Well, the chance that they were less likely to be playing they had fewer minutes played, and I love this one, fewer com passes completed. I mean, they're really not playing very well. And even five months later, they still kind of stink. And so these are, you know, elite athletes who are clearly, they're, they're not having anything related to, that we think's related, but they're not playing as well, they're not on the field as often, and they're making fewer passes. So, you know, it's kind of funny, but it, it is interesting because here you got even elite athletes are, are struggling after they get it. So there's no reason to let everybody get it. So what's the alternative? Well, Israel's, let's just keep giving everybody more boosters. They want to give a fourth booster. Pretty soon it'll be a fifth booster, sixth booster, you know, pretty soon we'll have 10 boosters. But so they were the first ones to actually roll out fourth boosters for everybody over 60. And so there was a study done. Does it, is it really effective? So the second booster shot they looked in Pfizer of 154 people and Moderna 120 people. And a fourth shot, so that's a second booster, increased antibodies again, not as high as they did in the third shot, the first booster, but it didn't have any impact on in preventing Omicron infections. So, you know, the concept that if we keep boosting the same people isn't very smart. I mean, it's just not going to work. What we need to do is get the people who are unvaccinated vaccinated. So there was a, a simpler, similar thing. This was a, uh, a simulation model looking if we could do a second booster, a third booster, a fourth booster, would that really help? Yeah, and it incrementally reduces the number of people who would be infected. But that's not the problem. The problem is we have people who are unvaccinated. That's the real problem. We've got to get people vaccinated. So is there any evidence that, makes, that that makes sense? Yeah, look at this. This is from England, ICU admissions. The red bars are people who are unvaccinated. The blue and the green are both vaccinated and boosted. So if you're vaccinated, you know, you have very low probability of, we know, of serious illness and death. And if you're boosted, even lower, but those are relatively small. Look at what happens if you're unvaccinated. So the focus everywhere has to be get more people vaccinated, not keep boosting the people who are already vaccinated. And this is really interesting when you start looking at uh, countries and their level of vaccination. You know, I, I wanted to show you in the beginning, remember that little arrow to Chile, where it was not as bad as the rest of the world? Well, Chile has the highest vaccination rate. They have 87% of their population that has been vaccinated. Uh, and the reason for that, as I've mentioned several times now, they, they participate in a nationwide study to look at vaccination efficacy. The second most vaccinated country is China. So I think it's going to save them from the Olympics if it, if it saves them at all. Italy is 75%. Israel, for all the talk about Israel, only 65% of the population has been vac fully vaccinated. And if you think about an R number of 10, we talked about the infection number. If the R number is 10, to get to herd immunity, you have to hit 90% of people immune. Well, the only country that's even close is Chile and China. 
You know, Italy's in the 80s. The United States is in the 60s. Israel's in the 60s. You, know, you can't get rid of this virus if there's so few people. So is there an alternative approach? <laughs> the idea is to get more people vaccinated. So the Italian government is now mandated for people over 50 that they be vaccinated. And they're putting in place, if you're unvaccinated, you can't enter businesses like banks and post offices and some stores. So they're, they're pushing, you know, if, you, if you're unvaccinated, you, you can't shop. Um, and, you know, they're, they're not, it used to be that if you're over, um, if, you're, if you showed that you had proof of a negative test, you could do all these things. But they're saying not, not anymore. You have to show proof that you're vaccinated or have recovered from an infection. And as I said, Chile's uh, vaccination uh, program has been incredibly successful, and they are now starting booster shots for people who are vulnerable. <laughs> West, West Virginia, I love them. Uh, they're now a asking to do a fourth COVID shot for people who are at risk. Uh, and the FDA is now approving boosters for people over the age of 12 and moved it from six months to, to five months. But what we actually need, you know, we're, we're focusing on a lot of this testing, but we, what we actually need is more mandates for vaccination. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court struck that down. They're, they're obviously not public health officials, and I still think we should use Lily's plan, which is you can't travel unless you're vaccinated. Just like Lily can't travel unless she's vaccinated, people shouldn't be able to travel unless they're vaccinated. Okay, well, thank God we have the Winter Olympics coming up. I miss our Olympic update. It's now in Beijing. Let's, let's go back down memory lane Japan, <laughs> I love them. Summer Olympics, they have no, no uh, COVID, and then they have the largest spike in the world leading to the prime minister's resignation. But what's different? You know, it's gonna be the Beijing Winter Olympics. So what is different? Well, China has announced the tickets to the Winter Olympics will no longer be sold to the general public. <laughs> they tried that in Japan. Best of luck with you. <laughs> Only certain approved groups will be allowed <laughs> to watch the Olympics in person, and they will be undergoing, this is my favorite, strict measures. I don't know what strict measures are, but I don't want to be involved with them. Uh, so that, you know, that was the same, actually. Uh, they had limited uh, uh, observations of people could attend in limited numbers in Japan. They also said athletes and others arriving in the Olympics will be kept in a bubble. <laughs> See how well that worked for Japan. Okay, that's the same. So let's read the same. What's different? Well, China's really closing its borders. That's different. Uh, last week, the Civil Aviation uh, Administration halted many flights from the United States, just for fun. Uh, but, that, you know, that's different. They're restricting travel into the, into the country. And they say, and this is def very different, all people entering Beijing will have to get a PCR test within 72 hours of arrival. So that's different. You know, so because they're, they have, they're almost you know, 85%, 88% vaccinated as a country. They're putting all these measures. They may squeak by, <laughs> but the virus is smarter than everybody, so who knows? So, and you know, the other problem is we're now focused on tests. I've been watching the news. We need more tests, we need more tests, we need more tests. Well, yes, we need more tests, but the problem is there's been a bunch of studies looking at, you know, how good are the tests at identifying Omicron? And, you know, they're okay, but not great. So if you look at uh, one fairly stu good large study that's uh, in, in press right now, they looked at a bunch of Omicron cases, and for several days, bef while people were infectious, uh, the antigen tests were negative. And I have that in my own family experience. My son was positive, had Omicron. He didn't test, we were testing him every day. He didn't test positive until the fourth day. So I'm not sure that testing is as important as getting more people vaccinated. Well, I, uh, let me put it this way. I know testing is not as important as getting more people vaccinated. And so, you know, this 500 million uh, coronavirus test kits uh, that you can order online, you know, great. It'll be helpful for get family get-togethers, but frankly, what we need is more vaccinations. Okay, so, you know, I, one of the things that I'm most excited about is at the end of 2021, you know, I look back. You know, even if it's 2022, you gotta look back on 2021. So what were the things that were really impressive to me in year 2021, particularly around the concept of who needs scientists anyway when I can get information on the internet. So here are my top 10 stories from 2021 about why did we need scientists? I can get all I need uh, on the internet. So number 10, of course, and you can't, you can't leave this one out, drinking bleach is a cure. I mean, you know, it's not political, but you can't, you just can't let that one go. You know, it just so, We'll just move on, but drinking bleach as, as a cure for COVID was, 
was fantastic. My other one, of course, is uh, TikTok, fantastic uh, a website. I love to watch TikTok. They have all this great information like vaccines cause infertility. And by the way, there's a microchip being implanted. So number nine is the great information around infertility and getting a microchip in your arm when you're vaccinated. That's, that's got to be number nine on the top ten list. <laughs> but no, wait, that's not bad enough. Number eight, uh, because there's a doctor who said, you know what, if you were stupid enough to get vaccinated, don't worry, we can get rid of you. We can detox you with a detox bath. And all it takes is get in the bathtub, and this is fantastic, uh, with baking soda, Epsom salts, betonite clay, and one cup of borax, and it'll take all the bad stuff from the vaccine side. So thank you. That's a doctor, supposedly. Number eight on the list. Number seven, and this, I just, I just, how can, how can you make getting a vaccine a bad thing? Well, two women in Central Florida managed to dress up as elderly, uh, elderly women so they could jump ahead of the line and get vaccinated before they were eligible for it. So, you know, it's hard to get vaccinated and look bad, but they did it. Oh, number six, of course, we got to look back on our, our, our fabulous athletes, Aaron Rodgers. And even though it's 2022, I'm going to throw in Novak Djokovic uh, for their views that if you can throw a football or hit a tennis ball, you definitely have special Zen immunity. So you're immune just because you're an athlete. Now that is taking role modeling to a new level. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen, for trying to do the right thing for the world in, in, in supporting vaccinations. Uh, number five on the list, of course, was the Italian man with the rubber arm. I love that guy. Because, you know, unlike Novak and Aaron Rodgers, he's not lying. He's just making up an arm. <laughs> Anything to not, to not get vaccinated. The rubber arm, what I love is, it's, uh, to me, it's better than a fake toe. <laughs> okay, number four for drama. And this one, I got to give it to Representative Matt Gates, who wore a gas mask on the floor when they were doing a vote on emergency funding to fight COVID. But that was actually outdone by another representative who said masks actually cause COVID. And he saw that on the internet. God love it. Who needs physicians? We got the internet. Okay, number three, we've already mentioned, but let the summer games <laughs> proceed. You got to love the Japanese Olympics. And, you know, poor Prime Minister Suga, who's like resigned in shame. Hopefully he's still, you know, alive. Uh, and number two, number two, the Sturgis bike rally. Let's get a million people together in the middle of a global pandemic. They, I love this. They, you know, they traced 250,000 cases to that. And meanwhile, the governor, you know, said, oh, it was totally appropriate to do that. So God love the Sturgis bike rally. And they did it again the next year. God love them. And then number one on the list, and I still I just love this, Boris Johnson declaring July 19th, Freedom from the Virus Day in the UK, which began the giant wave of the pandemic, worse than ever. But he's still, he's still there, so God love him. So this is my top 10 list of great things that happened in 2021. Next week we'll be back with shout outs, but I couldn't, I couldn't help but think about and reflect upon 2021. So have a great weekend. Uh, avoid the terrible weather on the East Coast, and I can't wait to see you next week.